Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Righteous by faith, we're going to be in the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verses 15 through 21. So as you're turning there, I just want to bring this up, the big idea for this sermon, the, the main point of what we're studying this morning is this, and it is extremely simple. The only way to achieve the righteousness of Christ is to have faith in Christ. The only way to achieve the righteousness of Christ is to have faith in Christ. That seems rather simple, doesn't it? That doesn't seem too hard, but we see Peter in chapter 2, verses, verse 11, not look at it that way. Remember, he was pulling back from eating with the Gentiles when the Judaizers showed up. He still thought that there was unclean things. Please follow along as I read Galatians 2, verses 15 through 21. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Amen. Who is Paul addressing? Who is it that Paul is addressing right here in the beginning verses. In verse 15, who is Paul addressing? He's addressing Jewish Christians. See, Paul has now shifted his direct focus from Peter in, in verse 14 to the rest of the Jewish Christians. So by saying Gentile sinners, is Paul claiming the Jews are without sin? Is that what he's saying? Oh, those Jewish or those Gentile sinners, is he saying, well, the Jews are without sin? I don't think that that's what he's saying. That's not what he's indicating. See, the Jews had the law and the Gentiles did not. That's what he's saying. In those days, it was common for the Jews to call Gentiles Gentile sinners. It wasn't just good enough to call them Gentiles. They were Gentile sinners. And we have all sorts of terminology today for all different types of people. We use all types of slang terms to describe certain people. I'm going to allow you to use your imagination because if I brought a few of those up, I would offend some people. But we do that. When people are from certain locations, we call them such and such. Or if we know something about them that's contrary to where we're at and the people that we hang out with, we call them blah, 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 blah. We're not going to get into that. But that's what he's doing as a Jew. He's saying Gentile sinners. But he's not indicating that the Jews are without sin. See, the Jews were inside the circle of the Old Covenant, or the Covenant Law. The Gentiles were like Greg. You guys remember Greg from that movie, Meet the Falkers? You guys remember that, don't you? Remember Greg was outside the Falkers family circle of trust? Well, that's kind of how the Jews were viewing the Gentiles. They were outside that circle, so they called them Gentile sinners. And we get it from this verse. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. So don't let that throw you off and, and you see that terminology, Gentile sinners, and Paul's basically saying, well, they're with sin, but we're not. So right off the bat, we're, we're recognizing that his focus is on Jewish Christians. That's who he's talking to. Our next question is this. 
How do we achieve righteousness? From looking at the text this morning, we can ask this question. How is it that we receive righteousness? We receive righteousness through faith in Christ. That's how we receive righteousness. It's that simple. Through our faith in Jesus Christ. You want to be righteous? And I'm not talking 70s righteous, like that's righteous. I'm talking you want to be righteous. You want to be considered righteous to a holy God? Have faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. It is that simple. This is the first time in all of Scripture that we see this word justified. What does Paul mean by justified? I think it's okay for us to slow down here for a second and and define this term. What does Paul mean specifically when he says justified? Simply, he means this, made righteous. You are made right with God. That's what he means when he says justified. You are justified in God's eyes. You are made righteous in God's eyes. You are made right in God's eyes when you have faith in Jesus Christ. It doesn't get more simple than that. You can complicate it like Peter all day long. But your righteousness is contingent on your faith in Jesus. The sinner who believes in Jesus and his work upon the cross is declared righteous. That's who's declared righteous. See, God makes us right with him. He, we don't make ourselves right with God. And unfortunately, and I think too often, we get that backwards. We think that we make ourselves right with God. But that's not the case. God has made us right with him because of Jesus and his work upon the cross. But we find ourselves saying things, or we hear people say things like this, you know, I've really been working on myself lately. What? That's not what the Bible's teaching me. That's not what Paul's talking about here. I've been working on myself lately? Did you recognize that Paul assumed that this was common knowledge in this verse? If you look at this verse a little, little closer, he, he isn't like introducing this as something new to the Jewish Christians. He assumed that this was already known. Look where it says, yet we know that. If he didn't assume that this was already known, he wouldn't write, yet we know that. Yet we know that in order to be justified, we must be free of any self-righteousness. So therefore, we can't say, well, I've been working on myself lately. I'm going to clean myself up. I'm going to make myself right with God. No. God makes us right with him. We must understand that plenty of good people will not receive the reward of eternal life. And that's a tough pill to swallow. There's plenty of good people out there. There's plenty of people who do Plenty of good things, good deeds all the time. Every time you look at them, they're always doing something good. You never see them doing something wrong. Never see them taking a misstep. But that doesn't mean that they're going to heaven. That doesn't mean they're receiving the reward of eternal life. Why? Well, to do something good, you don't have to have faith in Jesus. You could do something good and have faith in yourself. There's plenty of people out there that do good things. You consider them a good person, but really, behind the scenes, in their heart, they have faith in themselves. They're doing this for their own personal gain. They may say the right thing. They may do the right thing, but guess what? When it comes down to it, their motivation is them and them only. It's not their faith in Jesus Christ. Your justification is credited to the righteousness of Christ, not your righteousness. We can't forget that. We are justified. We are made right. We are righteous before a holy God because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Not because of anything that we've done. Imagine it like this. 
You're in a courtroom. Real simple. Courtroom setting. God is the judge. Satan the prosecutor. Jesus is the defense attorney. And you are the defendant. God as the judge is listening to the prosecutor, Satan, saying, well, you know, you're guilty of this and they're guilty of that and they're guilty of this and they're guilty of that and they're guilty of this and they're guilty of that and I don't have enough fingers so I'm going to stop counting because the list goes on and on and every single one of us in this room is guilty of more than what we're even capable of recognizing within ourselves. Satan knows it all. He's saying it to God, the holy judge. They're guilty, 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 guilty. You as a defendant, you're sitting there thinking like, oh my gosh, this is worse than what I thought. But you have a defendant. You have an advocate, Jesus Christ, who says, yes, my client is guilty of everything listed and even more. But judge, when you go to sentence my client, let me serve that sentence for them. I don't care what this prosecutor knows. I don't care what everybody knows about my client. Allow my client to find freedom, and I will serve this for them. That's what God's done for us upon the cross. And that's when we get it wrong when we say things like, well, I'm working on myself right now. When we have that attitude, I'm going to clean myself up. Well, I'll show up to church when I get myself right with God. We're dirty. And the only way we can be clean is through our faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done. Remember that courtroom setting. And remember the defendant that we have. The Bible tells us that we have an advocate. Our advocate, our defender is Jesus Christ. So let's now learn how we we're mistaken to believe that we earn our own salvation by asking this next question. The question is this, what disqualifies us from achieving righteousness? What disqualifies us from achieving righteousness? Our actions. That doesn't, that doesn't sound right, does it? But it's the truth. Our actions disqualify us from achieving righteousness. Galatians 2.17 but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. Do you know what argument this rebukes? Do you know why Paul is writing this? Paul is rebuking the argument that grace of God promotes sin through Christ. See, the Judaizers, the opponents of the gospel of grace, they were insisting that if justification is by grace through faith, that would only promote one to continue in their sin. Because they're saying, well, I have this grace, so I have this privilege and opportunity now to continue in my sin. Because if it's by grace through faith, then I don't have to do anything, I can just continue on sinning. That's what they were saying, but this is what Paul is actually rebuking. So is this accusation an accurate portrayal of the gospel of grace? No. The gospel of grace says we're free from the slavery of sin and are now are slaves to the righteousness of Christ. If we live from grace, if we appreciate the grace that God has extended us, we're going to want to be a slave to righteousness. It's one of two ways. And I hate to break the bad news to you. Either way, you're going to be a slave. Doesn't sound great, does it? But it's the truth. So here's the question. You want to be a slave of righteousness or do you want to be a slave to sin? I'm not picking the latter. We know where the latter leads. I want to be a slave to righteousness. The gospel of grace doesn't teach us that since God has extended you grace and you now have faith in the work of Jesus Christ, you are going to receive eternal life, have as much fun as you want on this earth, commit as much sin as you want to commit, and enjoy it. Life is short. No. 
if I'm truly saved, if I truly have faith in Jesus Christ, I'm going to want to pursue righteousness. Now, am I going to sin along the way? You better believe I'm going to sin along the way. But what's the difference? The difference is I have the Holy Spirit. He is living in me, convicting me of that sin, and I'm wanting to repent. I want to turn from that sin and turn towards that righteousness, the way in which I know God sees me because of my faith in Jesus Christ. The question then becomes, what's your desire for you specifically? Do you find joy in continuing in your sin? Or do you find joy in obeying God? That's the question. We're still asking this question. What disqualifies us from achieving righteousness? We know it's our actions. Galatians 2.18, For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. You know what kind of people I like? I love people who say one thing and do another. Don't you guys love people who say one thing and then do another? Doesn't that make you feel real good and have a lot of confidence in what they say? I mean, with, with me loving people who say one thing and do another, I can't wait to rock the vote coming up here. I have a great opportunity to vote for the people I love. Well, this is what Paul's talking about. When Peter ate with the Gentiles, he was saying one thing about the law. When Peter pulled back from eating with the Gentiles for fear of the Judaizers, he was saying another thing about the law. By eating with the Gentiles, Peter was showing that we're saved by grace through faith. He wasn't looking to the law to uphold his salvation. He was demonstrating being saved by grace through faith. When Peter pulled back from eating with the Gentiles, his actions indicated that salvation was by grace through faith in Jesus plus. See, when we say things like, well, I'm going to clean myself up, that's Jesus plus theology. That's saying, I'm saved by my faith in Jesus plus what I can do. That's not what the gospel of grace teaches us. Our salvation is based upon nothing that we can do. You are incapable of saving yourself. I take great comfort in that message. When you dig deep into your own insecurities that you try to hide and mask from other people, you know what those insecurities are. You know what you're really incapable of. And when you see that in yourself, you look to what Jesus has done and you realize and you take refuge in that because you know that he is so much stronger than you could ever imagine being. In fact, in your weakness, his strength is perfected. That's the message I can get behind. That's not the message the world wants to send out. The world wants to send out the message of being self-made. So if I would have won that Powerball a couple weeks ago, I would have been self-made because I walked down to the Circle K and bought a ticket. No, I didn't. I actually did it for a coworker who wanted me to do it because I was going down to the Circle K to get a cup of coffee. But could I say I'm self-made? Could I even say that I made the paper that the ticket was on? That the numbers were printed on? Could I say I chopped down the tree that made the paper? No. Did I make the machine that made? No. That's what society wants us to believe. It's smoke and mirrors. We're not self-made. No matter how well we've done, we are reliant upon Jesus Christ. This Jesus plus stuff is junk. It's garbage. It is Jesus and Jesus only. Look at verse 18, the very beginning of verse 18, and ask this question to yourself. Look at the very beginning. For if I rebuild what I tore down... What if we rebuild the Berlin Wall? Would that make any sense? What good would that do? Cold War is done. What do people see in your actions? Do they see somebody trying to reconstruct a wall? Is your attitude, I'm just waiting until I clean myself up? Is your attitude, I'm just going to work on myself? Is your attitude, I'm just going to get right with God first before I come to church? Those are questions we need to ask ourselves. What are people seeing in our lives? What do believers understand? 
What is it that believers understand? Believers understand this. Societal morals lead to death. Morals that are okay by society, made up by society, actually lead to death. Galatians 2.19 For though the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. Who died to the law? Paul. Who is yet in this text to die to the law? Peter. Peter is yet to die to the law. By dying to the law, Paul was no longer motivated to uphold the law like he once was. See, his motivation to uphold the law was once to earn his salvation. That was no longer his motivation to uphold the law. So why did Paul die to the law? Well, it's right there in the text. So that I might live to God. Now, does Paul still obey the law? Yes. Are we to throw the law out? No. But we don't look at the law as leading to our salvation in the way in which we uphold it, by doing what's right. Our salvation is contingent on our faith in Jesus. If we have true, genuine faith in Jesus Christ, we're going to want to obey God in His Word. This is where the law is similar to what we said at the outset. When you're motivated by the law and not by grace and faith, you're reminiscent of a child to his parent. It's the, daddy, 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 look at me, look at me, look at me. That's what Paul's saying he's dead to. He's done trying to say, God, look at me, look at me, look what I'm doing. Look how good I am. He's done with that. That's why he's dead to that law, but he's going to be dead to the law in order to live free in Jesus Christ. So what's the modern day societal moral standards that we see? We see people with an attitude of, I don't lie, I don't cheat, I don't steal, I don't drink, I don't smoke. I'm kind to everyone, even the ones that I hate, which really doesn't make any sense. I open the door for little old ladies. I do all these good things. Look at what I'm doing. Don't I look so good? Morals come from the Holy Spirit within us. We can't forget that. Society's moral standards do not come from God. They come from man. So a believer's moral compass is from the Spirit. He is the one who has put this plan into action in our lives, this new birth that we experienced as believers. He has determined our moral compass. Society, not the case. Society's morals are man-made. And man-made morals cannot save you no matter how well you uphold them. This final question has two answers. What do believers understand? The second thing that believers understand is this. Dying with Jesus leads to life. That does not make any sense whatsoever to the world. Dying to Jesus leads to life. Well, it's the truth. Dying to Jesus leads to life. Let's look at the first part of verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. When Paul lived, he lived according to the law, like us with the societal moral standards. His faith in Christ's fulfillment of the law begs him to write this very point. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. See, some people say that there's no I in team. That's great. I like it. It's going to work for my kids as they get older and I see them be selfish. There's no I in team, Leighton. Reese, you're being selfish on the court. There's no I in team. Pass the ball. That works. I have no problem with that. But I like to say there's no I in you. Who's the you? Jesus. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Who is Paul talking about? He's talking about Jesus Christ. 
He's been crucified with Christ. The you is Jesus and his work upon the cross. Our faith in Christ means we're dead to the daddy, 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 look at me. That's what our faith in Christ means. What do believers understand? They believe, believers understand that dying, to, dying with Jesus leads to life. The second part of verse 20 says this, In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you notice anything intimate about Paul's choice of words there in the text? In the very, that last section of verse 20? It, he gets intimate. It gets personal. He writes, who loved me and gave himself for me. Our relationship with Christ is personal. Our relationship with Christ is intimate. Look at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7. What does Jesus talk about? For wide is the gate. Many go in that way. The wide gate leads to destruction and many are going on a path that leads to destruction. For narrow is the gate. Why is that gate narrow? The gate's wide so many can go through. The gate's narrow because it's an individual, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can enter one at a time. I believe that this verse right here is a great example and a reminder of that. Jesus gave himself for me. I need to live my life appreciating that grace. Knowing that this is personal. This isn't universalism. Not everybody gets saved. If everybody gets saved, what good is it? Then what the Judaizers are saying about grace leading to a sinful life, go there, so be it. If God saves everybody, then we might as well start sinning. No, I want to appreciate what he's doing for me. I don't want to make this about me. I don't want to see the I in you. I want to see him and what he's doing. Are you living your life as though you've been crucified with Christ? Does your life indicate I or does your life indicate you? you being Jesus, the best indicator is to check your motivation. That's the way in which we can check. What are your motives? You know your motives. You're being nice to somebody. Why are you being nice to them? Are you being nice to them so they like you? So they think higher of you? Or are you being nice to them because you're appreciating what you know Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross? Because your faith is leading you there. Because your moral compass is the Holy Spirit. If your moral compass is a man-made society standard of what morals are and what they aren't, then you're just doing it so they like you and think higher of you. That's a fear of man. An example would be this. I, I know a guy who joined a Bible study only to promote his business. Wait, are you serious? He even told me that. Owns a small business. Say, oh yeah, I'm going to the, that church over there. I'm doing this, this book study that they're doing on Tuesday nights. I'm like, that's great, man. That's a good book, you know. Well, you know, I, I did it because I figured it could drum up more business. I could make more connections. I'm like, what? What do you think that told me about that man right there? Where's it, where, where are his morals coming from? The world. What else does that tell me about that man? He's not saved. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit living within him. His moral compass is himself. He's the type of guy that would say he's self-made if he ever got the opportunity to brag. In our society, you have to be at least a millionaire to say you're self-made. But he's the kind of guy that would say that. And most importantly, looking at this verse, this isn't dying to Jesus. When we die to Jesus, we see the you. What do believers understand? They understand that dying with Jesus leads to life. Galatians 2 verse 21, our final verse for this morning. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. This is really the conclusion of Paul's argument right here. 
One commentator asked this question, and I, I think this is perfect. This is the best question I think you could ask at this point. He said this, he says, If humans could be right with God by obeying the law, why would he send his son to suffer and die on a cross? It doesn't make any sense. God's grace, not the law, is what saves. So aren't you glad you don't have to prove yourself to a holy God? When you take an evaluation of where you're at as a child of God, aren't you glad you don't have to prove yourself to a holy God? Now, how are you going to demonstrate this to non-believers that God has placed in your life? And that's the, the challenge I want to send you guys out with this morning. There are non-believers in your life that God has strategically placed in your life, how are you going to demonstrate to them how you've been rocked by this gospel message, this faith in Jesus, this dying with Jesus in your actions, in your words? What we learned this morning is this, and it's so simple. And I love, I love the simplicity of it. The only way to achieve the righteousness of Christ is to have faith in Christ. It is that simple. You want to be righteous, you want to be right with God, one way to do that. Have faith in Jesus Christ. We asked a few questions this morning, four to be exact. On the front end of these verses, we asked this. We wanted to know who was it that Paul was addressing. He was ad addressing Jewish Christians the second question we asked was this, how do we receive righteousness? We receive righteousness through faith. That's how. Very simple. Our faith in Jesus. What disqualifies us from receiving righteousness? Actions. Outside of our action of proclaiming faith in Jesus, all other actions that we look to, to qualify us for the righteousness of Christ, or to be righteous in God's eyes, actually disqualifies us. What do believers understand? All believers should understand two things. As a believer, you should understand two things. One is this. We're dead to the moral standard of society. What society says is right or wrong, we're dead to that. Our moral compass is the Holy Spirit in our heart. And the second thing that we should understand is this. Dying with Jesus leads to life. Heavenly Father, I just pray that we come to a better understanding of your grace and your gospel message. Lord, to live from grace is something we will spend the rest of eternity learning how to do. I just pray that you poise us. We learn to position ourselves so your spirit can lead us in this endeavor. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.